the presentation this evening is called The Bottomless Pit Opened, and our key text for this evening is Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1. So if we would care to go there now, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 1, it says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and unto him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Now let's pause for a second and think to ourselves, what do stars represent when we're looking at biblical prophecy? If we turn to Revelation chapter 12, you will see in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9, the devil was cast down to the earth and his angels were cast down with him. Now, if you compare that with chapter, sorry, verse 4 of the same chapter, so Revelation 12 and verse 4, you will see there that his, that is Satan's tail, drew down a third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered and for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Now, I think if I ask you who was the woman that was about to deliver a child, you'll know that this is the, the, the church, this is God's people. Christ was about to be born, and we're told that Satan was there ready when Christ was born. But also the important point from verses 4 and verse 9, we can see that the stars that came down from heaven, these were angels that were cast down when Satan was thrown out of heaven. But of course, these are fallen angels, inasmuch as Satan himself was a fallen angel. So these angels that were cast down, they also were fallen angels. Now we might ask ourselves, what were these angels doing? Once they've come down to the earth, what are they doing when they come to the earth? Now, I can't speak for all of the one third of the fall of the angels that fell and were cast down, but I can give you an interesting reference for one of those angels. And to look at that angel, I'm going to do something a little bit unusual this evening. I'm going to open up the Islamic holy book, the Quran, and I'm going to look at Surah al-Baqarah, that's the, the second chapter of the Quran. And there it says in verse 97, Say, O Muhammad, to mankind, who is an enemy to Gabriel? For he it is who hath revealed this scripture to thy heart by Allah's leave, confirming that which was revealed before it, and a guidance and glad tidings to believers. Now, you might say to me, well, wait a minute, John, why are you quoting the Quran? We don't believe in the Quran, and we don't have put any relevance upon it, so why are we looking at that in a Bible study? Now, the reason is quite simple, because in this verse, Muhammad was being told that it was an angel that was revealing the Quran to him. Now, I don't know if you have any knowledge of the supposed revelation of the Quran, but basically, Muhammad saw something that at first he thought was a demon, and he was very clear upon this. He, he thought that there was a demon coming to trouble him because this being came and grabbed him, held him, gripped him tight, and said to him, uh, read. And he said, I, I can't read. And the demon grabbed him tighter and said, read. And he said, I can't read. And the third time this being gripped him and said, read. And he said, I cannot read. And the being then said to him, okay, recite, Korah. That's where we get the word Quran from. And Muhammad started to recite this revelation that came from this being that was later became the Quran. Now, the Bible talks about something happening. He talks about an angel coming down, fallen from heaven, and in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 2, it says this, he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose out of the, the smoke of the pit, the smoke like a great furnace, the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Now, let's just examine this. 
a bottomless pit is being opened. Now, the word for bottomless pit in the Greek here is a word abusos. Now, this is a very interesting word because it's the Greek word from which we get our English word, abyss. So here it was, this word abusos, but also this is the, the same word that's used in the Greek version of the Old Testament in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, talking about the way that the uh, world was before, before the creation. And so here is this word being used, abusos. Now, this bottomless pit that's being referred to, it's not some subterranean cavern. It's not some yawning chasm somewhere in the universe. John here is describing the prophetic picture that unfolded before his wondering eyes. In vision, he saw an actual pit, but the shutting up of the dragon in the pit was merely a symbolic way of showing that Satan's activities will be brought to a halt. That's when Satan himself is thrown into this pit, because he was there that he would deceive people no more. But in this verse, in Revelation 9 and verse 2, here the bottomless pit is open. A smoke rises out of the pit and it obscures the sun. Now, it's interesting that the Bible actually refers to Christ at one point as being the sun, the S-U-N, of righteousness. It seems that Christ was going to be obscured by reason of the smoke that's going to come out of this pit. And this bottomless pit, this place of desolation, is a good description for a certain part of the world. Let's have a look at a description from the book um, Towards Understanding Islam. It talks about Arabia, the abyss of darkness, and it's an abyss of darkness in an era of ignorance, where it says, in that era of ignorance, there was a country where darkness lay even thicker. The neighboring countries of Persia, Byzantium, and Egypt possessed at least a glimmer of civilization and a faint light of learning, but Arabia could receive no share of its cultural influences. It stood isolated. It was cut off, as they say, by vast oceans of sand. Now, look at what John says happened. When this pit was open, the smoke rose up, and he says in verse 3, and there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Now, who or what is John referring to at this time? If we look at the writings of Edmund Burke, Edmund Burke lived in the 18th century, and he wrote in a book called the Annual Register of 1787, he said, the inhabitants of Syria have remarked that locusts constantly come from the desert of Arabia. Now, isn't that interesting? Locusts are known to come from the deserts of Arabia. In fact, we can go to a book by William Bain Fisher, The Middle East, A Physical, Social, and Regional Geography, and he also says, locusts originate in the deserts of Arabia and the Sahara. So here is this understanding that it's locusts that come out of this desert area. And interestingly, when we look at the Bible, we see the same thing being said there. In the book of Judges, that's in chapter 7 and verse 12, it says there, and the Midianites and the Amalekites. Now, who are the Midianites and the Amalekites? You might know the Midianites. The Midianites dwelt in the land of Midia. The Amalekites, they are the descendants of Esau. So those that are dwelling in Media, the descendants of Esau, and all the children of the east, it says, lay along the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And this word that's translated um, grasshoppers here, also is the one that's translated locusts. So here they are saying that the Midianites and the Amalekites, they were being referred to as being like grasshoppers or locusts. They and their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. 
Now, again, it's interesting that when we look back at history, we can see Charles Forster mentions this in his book, Mohammedan, sorry, Mohammedanism Unveiled. And he says this, he says, and in a genuine production of the native news of Arabia, the Bedouin romance of Antar, the locust is introduced as the national emblem of the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites. Now, if you speak to Muslims, Muslims will tell you that they believed that out of Isaac and Ishmael, it was Ishmael that was to be sacrificed on the mountain. They say because he was the firstborn, he was born before Isaac, therefore he was the one that was going to be offered as a sacrifice. They call themselves uh, descendants of Ishmael. Now, look at this next quote. It is a remarkable coincidence with those illustrative facts that Mohammedan tradition speaks of locusts having dropped into the hands of Mohammed bearing on their wings this inscription, we are the army of the great God. Now it's interesting to see how prophecy gets recognized by history. When we turn to Daubigny's history of the Reformation, we're going to see an interesting quote there. Now Daubigny is talking about the time in the seventh century, at the time when Islam actually rose up, the time when the Roman Empire had divided up into the ten toes of Daniel 2, the ten uh, divisions that were there. And you may remember we looked very carefully at which these divisions were and how we can be sure who they, who they were. Um, Daubigny goes on to say this. He says, at the beginning of the seventh century, these events were accomplishing in the West precisely at the period when the power of Muhammad arose in the East, prepared to invade another quarter of the world. Now, what are the events that he's talking about? In the sixth century, the Roman church has got its power. You remember we, we also looked at this, at how Rome gets its power from Justinian, Belisarius, the general of the Romans, comes and defeats the, the Vandals, then the Ostrogoths are being defeated, then comes the Burgundians, the Alans, and then the Visigoths are also defeated, and suddenly the Bishop of Rome has the opportunity to exercise the authority and power that he was given by Justinian. He was given this authority and power in 533, 538, the siege of Rome is broken, and he goes out to exercise this power. And one of the first things he does is that he starts to persecute those who were opposing his power. Now, at the same time, as this persecution arises, or let's say a hundred years later, in fact, suddenly out of the east arises Islam. And Islam conquers, as you can see on the map on the screen, it conquers all the way across from Spain in the west right through to Persia in the east. There is this crescent-shaped um, empire of Islam that is there, and it cuts off the rest of Africa from Europe. Now, why is this important? The reason why this is important is because down in Ethiopia, you may have seen the news recently that the oldest Bible in the world is there in Ethiopia. It, or rather, I should say, it's the oldest complete one. And one of the interesting things is that when you compare the Ethiopian Bible with the Bible that we have today, you find that there is no real material difference. The truth of the matter is that the Bible was preserved in Ethiopia during the time when in Europe the Bible was being suppressed. The Bible, having been translated in Antioch, had gone down into Ethiopia. Um, remember, Ethiopia was the first country that had been evangelized when Philip baptized the Ethiopian eunuch on his way home from Jerusalem. He went back home. Ethiopia became a Christian country by the 7th century. We know that it was a very strong Christian country. The king or the Nagus of Ethiopia ruled a Christian empire there. 
the Bible was kept down in Ethiopia. So when the Roman Catholic Church suppressed the Bible, had it translated in Latin, had it bound and kept on the pulpit so that the ordinary people couldn't read it, the scriptures were not lost. And indeed, if we were to look through history, and this is just a, an, an advert for a next study that's going to come up, we're going to look at the history of God's people, of God's Sabbath keeping people, and we will see that when there was a danger that the scriptures were going to be lost, they went to Ethiopia, they looked to Ethiopia to get their scriptures back again. Now let's continue with the, the quotations from history if we can. Rome founded her usurped authority between the East, which she repelled, and the West, which she summoned to her aid. She raised her throne between two revolts, startled by the shouts of the Arabs now becoming the masters of Spain, who boasted that they would speedily arrive in Italy by the gates of the Pyrenees and the Alps, and proclaim the name of Mohammed in the Seven Hills, Rome in the prospect of ruin turned her frightened eyes around her and threw herself into the arms of the Franks. What's going on? The Muslim armies are starting to spread out, are starting to conquer, and Rome had to stop suppressing those who held on to the truth and had to look to defend herself. She turned to the Franks for protection, for military protection. Now, why was she doing that? Well, because after the death of Muhammad, the, one of his companions, Abu Bakr, became the first caliph of Islam. His caliphate only lasted for just over two years. It was 27 months from 632 to 634 AD. But I want to show you something really important here. And so just bear with me as we look at this. Here is a speech from Abu Bakr that was given to the troops when he went out to conquer. And remember, he's going up towards Europe to go and do his conquest. And this is what he tells his troops. He says, injure not the date palm, nor burn it with fire, nor cut down the fruit bearing trees. Slaughter not the sheep or cows or camels, except for the purposes of food. And then he says, you will pass by persons who spend their lives in retirement in the monasteries. Leave them in their state of retirement. You will also come across people who will bring various kind of foods to you in vessels. Sorry, let me just move on here. Yes, there we are. You will also come across people who will bring various kinds of food to you in vessels. When you eat these things, one the other, you should recite the name of Allah. You will also meet people having their heads shaven in the center with hair flowing all around like tendons. Now, does that make you think of anybody? When he says you're going to meet people who are going to have hair flowing around their, their shaven heads like tendons, you can see I've put some pictures up on the screen at the bottom uh, left there. These are pictures of Catholic monks. The description that's being given here is of Catholic monks. Now, he refers to these people, and he says that if you see them, you should strike them with the sword. And then he says, march forward in the name of Allah. Let's just go forward a little bit. There we are. Strike them with the sword. March forward in the name of Allah. May he protect you from the attack of the enemy and from pestilence. Here, Abu Bakr says very clearly, there are certain people you should leave them alone. Don't touch them. But there are other people that you should touch. And how does he describe the difference between them? He says, well, there's one group they are, are, are the right people that you leave them alone. The other people with shaved heads and their hair hanging around the shaven part, he says, those are the ones that you should strike. You should strike them with the sword. And he then goes on to say, sorry, he, he, he then says that you should leave alone the other people. Now, if we turn back to the Bible, remember we were in Revelation chapter 9, we got to verse 3, 
I want to show you verse 4. Here is verse 4. And verse 4 says simply this. It was commanded them that, now who's the them? This is the, do you remember the locust power that's come out of the ground here? It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, we haven't spoken about this yet, but when we are going to speak about it later in this series, but what do you think it is? People who do not have the seal of God in their foreheads. Now, when we look at the seal of God, it is often said and truly said that the seal of God can be found in the Ten Commandments. In particular, it's found in the Fourth Commandment. Now, have you seen what's going on here? This quotation from the Bible, let's compare it with what Abu Bakr said. Abu Bakr said, injure not the date palm, nor burn it burn it with fire and cut not down the fruit bearing trees the bible gives this quote and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth neither any green thing neither any tree abu Bakr went on to say you will pass by persons who spend their lives in retirement in the monasteries leave them in their state of retirement you will also meet people having their heads shaven in the center with their hair flowing all around like tendons. Strike them with the sword. March forward in the name of Allah. The Bible continues by saying, only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. I think you'll agree with me that if you look at what's written there in Revelation chapter 9 and verse 4, this is a praise of what Abu Bakr said to his troops before he sent them out. The incredible thing is that Revelation 9-4 actually reveals Abu Bakr's speech 500 years before Abu Bakr was born. Isn't this the wonder of God's prophecy that God declares the end from the beginning? Before Abu Bakr was even conceived by his parents, God through the apostle John on the island of Patmos had written out the very words that Abu Bakr was going to speak to the Islamic armies as they went forward. Now, let's just go forward ourselves. We're going to go forward to the 16th century and the Reformation at that time. In particular, I want us to go to 1525. Now, in 1525, the Catholic Church had convened a, a, a diet, a general assembly of the Holy Roman Empire. The reason they'd done this, because there was a monk in Germany, Martin Luther by name, and he was becoming a problem to the church. And they wanted to get rid of, they wanted to deal with Martin Luther and anybody that was following his heresies. And so they made this statement, they came up with this command that all Lutherans shall be rooted out of the land. And wherever they are found, either by clergymen or laymen, they may be seized and burned. Now, this is actually an interesting statement because previously uh, it was the clergy who could go out and root out heretics. But now the problem of Martin Luther had become so great that they said, you know, not just the clergymen, but also the laymen. Anybody who finds a, a reformer, somebody following Luther, they have permission to root these people out, to seize them, and to burn them. Now the question here is, was this to be the end of the Reformation? Would the Reformation be snuffed out just at that point? Here history comes into play again, and we have another quote from Daubigny, and Daubigny says this, Death removed from the pontifical throne the man who had put Luther under ban of the church. Disturbances occurred in Spain and compelled Charles to visit his kingdom beyond the Pyrenees. War broke out between this prince and Francis I, and if that were not enough to occupy the emperor, Suleiman, 
made an incursion into Hungary. Now, Suleiman is the leader of the Islamic army. There in the 16th century, Suleiman the Great is leading his army up into Europe. He comes up into Hungary. And it would seem that if he can get through Hungary, he would get through the whole of Europe. And so now Charles is really concerned. It's bad enough he has to start a fight with Francis I, but now the Islamic hordes are coming up from the south. And so he didn't have time to deal with Martin Luther. Instead, he had to turn and deal with the people coming up from the south back to Revelation chapter 9. Now we've jumped through a few verses. I, I, you know, I wish we had time to go through the chapter in detail because there is so much there we could talk about. But I want you to look at this, Revelation chapter 9 and verse 17. How many times have you read this and wondered exactly what this is talking about? Here John says, and thus I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were, as it were, the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. It's a terrible sight to behold. And I remember when I was in Hungary myself, I was meeting in a cafe with some Muslims there. We were supposed to be having Muslim studies, but I produced a Bible when I was there. And they had said to me about how oh, Islam is in the Bible, Muhammad's in the Bible. And I said, yes. And I opened up Revelation chapter nine and I read this verse to them. And I said to them, do you know what this verse is referring to? They looked at this verse, they looked at the colors, they looked at the description and they said, this is the armies of Islam. This is the colors. This sounds like a, a description of the Muslim armies. And of course it was because this is the colors that they use, the, the breastplates of fire, the yasin, the brimstone. Now, what about the heads of lions, horses with heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Some of the Arabians, when they, they are brought up with horses, they know horses very well, they can ride horses very well. Anybody, and I don't recommend this, but anybody who's followed horse racing will know the Arabian stallions. They are very powerful, fine horses. The Arabians, they learned to ride horses in such a way that they could fire a musket with one hand whilst they were holding the horse's rein with the other hand. In fact, they were so good at this that they could actually turn around in the saddle, face backwards, so that while the horse was racing in one direction, if someone was chasing them, they could turn around and fire at the person behind them. But now let's just think about an Arabian on his horse riding down across the plain. And if you were standing to one side and you looked, you wouldn't necessarily see the musket that was in his hand held down by his hips. But when he fires the musket, the barrel of the musket is level with the horse's head and the, the flames and sparks and smoke that comes out of the barrel of the musket looks like fire and smoke and brimstone coming out of the horse's mouth. Here was this description of the armies of Islam that were coming up to attack the Western forces, they had to do something about it. In fact, Luther talks, uh, sorry, Wiley in his history of Protestantism says this. He says that as the, the Roman Catholics armies were about to attack Luther and his followers, here is the quote he gives. He says, their swords were about to be unsheathed above Luther's head when lo, some hundred thousand Turkish scimitars are unsheathed above theirs. Now the place that you're looking at here in this picture, this is Wartburg Castle in Germany. Luther was to be tried by the Diet. And there came a time when Luther left the diet and as he was traveling to go home, thinking he had safe passage, 
actually there were men who were plotting to kill him. Suddenly, as he went through the forest, some horse riders came out, they grabbed him, they put a hood over his head, they grabbed the reins of his horse, and they rode off, and they took him to Wartburg Castle. Now, the great thing was that this was not enemies of Luther, this was actually Luther's friends. They took him to hide him in the castle of Wartburg, and it's really a blessing of God. Again, God's hand was over this, because what, uh, Luther goes in to Wartburg Castle, and there he translates the Bible into German. The Old Testament is translated into the German language so that now German people can start to read the Bible in their own language. Now let's go back to Wiley. Wiley talks about this situation in his book, The History of Protestantism, and he says, the moment Luther entered within the gates of the Wartburg, Solomon made such a sudden eruption into Europe, the execution of the Emperor's edict against Luther, with which they had been charged, must lie over until they had found a means of compelling Solomon and his hordes to return to their own land. He goes on to say, here is that quote I gave you just now from Wiley, their swords were about to be unsheathed above Luther's head, when lo, some hundred thousand Turkish scimitars are unsheathed above theirs. There was a great battle that took place. Now, Wiley, a historian, he wrote the following, which is a fascinating thing to see written. And this is what I love when historians recognize the hand of God. Wiley says, the Turk, obeying one whom he knew not, would straightway present himself on the eastern limits of Europe and in so menacing an attitude that the, the, that the swords unsheathed against the poor Protestants had to be turned to another quarter. Do you notice what Wiley is saying there? Isn't it amazing? He's recognizing God's hand was there. He goes on to say, the Turk was the lightning rod that drew off the tempest. Thus did Christ cover his little flock. And I love the fact that Wiley uses that phrase. You'll recognize that phrase. Thus did Christ cover his little flock with the shield of the Muslim. Have you ever thought that Islam could actually have been raised up to shield Christianity from the effects of the Dark Ages, from the effects of the Roman Catholic Church militant? And what does this actually mean? It raises up some questions in our mind. First of all, we have to ask, what is it that Christianity has that Islam doesn't have? I was in India in the city of Hyderabad. It would have been two years ago where I was talking with Seventh-day Adventist pastors out there. And one afternoon we went out to the shops and a lot, there is a great, um, Muslim, uh, sorry, there's a, there's a lot of Muslims that live in that area. And I was talking about how to reach out to Muslims. And we went into one shop and I was asking the young man in the shop something about how the shop was run. And he said, oh, I'm sorry, um, I can't answer that, but my, my brother can, it's his shop, but he's away praying at the moment. So I said to him, I said, ah, oh, so, obviously you're a Muslim. And he said, yes, yes, I am a Muslim. And I said to him, do you understand everything that you're reading in the Quran? And he said to me, what do you mean exactly? And so I said to him, I said, okay, in the Quran where it says Isa al-Masi, now Isa is the name of Jesus, al-Masi means Messiah. So Jesus the Messiah is the, the quotation I was using. I said to them, where it says Isa al-Masi, do you understand what it means for Jesus to be the Messiah? He thought for a while and he gave several different answers. He said, well, it means he's a prophet. And I said, no, 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 it's more than that. It says, well, it means he's a messenger. And I said, no, 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 it's, it's more than that. A prophet is a nabi, a, a messenger is Rasul al-Masi. What does that mean? And in the end, he confessed he didn't know. And I said, you know, if you go to the Christians, the Christians can tell you exactly what that means, because nine times in the Quran, in seven verses, it refers to Jesus 
the Messiah. And I said, if you follow what the Quran says, you will come and you will speak to the people of the book, the Ahl al-Kitab, who have been reading the book before. He said to me, what do you mean? And I said, okay, look at Surah al tauba the, the 10th chapter in the Quran. And I said, look at verse 94. Here is advice for Muhammad, which is also advice to all Muslims. If you are in doubt as to what we have revealed to you, then ask those who have been reading the book from before you. Now, when this was revealed to Muhammad, there was only one book that people were reading before because the Quran was revealed as a recitation. It was not written down during the lifetime of Muhammad. So this can only be referring to people who read the Bible. And I quoted this verse to him and I said, if you want to understand the meaning of the Quran, you have to go to the people of the book. You have to go to the Christians to find out the true meaning of Jesus the Messiah. Of course, he said to me, well, where can I find these people? And I said to him, you're talking to one of them now. And I said, would you like to have some studies? Would you like to study the Quran in the light of the Bible to see what it's saying? He readily agreed. He gave me his phone number. And with his agreement, I passed his phone number on to the pastor that was with me there. And I said, pastor, call this man, have studies with him. Because when Muslims recognize that we are the people that their Quran tells them to go to, they will come to us to find out those things that they cannot understand. Now, the other thing that's interesting is, remember, we were looking at the middle of the 16th century, that Luther was protected, that the Reformation would then flourish. Something else would happen as a result. Let's have a look at this man here. Do you recognize this man here? This is King James I of England. Now, 1603 is the year we've come to. A new king is on the throne. He's a Protestant, and he confirmed all the statutes that had been made against the Jesuits and the Catholic seminary priests in England. And by doing so, he made himself an enemy of those priests. But he did something else. He said, let us translate a Bible. So this is why this man is so important. Now, here we have a picture of the Old Lion Inn in Dunworth. In this bottom room that we're looking at, five Jesuits met together to plan the death of the Protestant King of England. These people were uh, Garnet, Greenwell, Catesby, Tesmond and Oldcorn and Guy Fawkes. Guy Fawkes was a soldier in the service of Philip of Spain, and there were six others that met with them. And if these plotters had succeeded in what they wanted to do, well, you know the plot that they were plotting. It's the gunpowder plot that we celebrate on November the 5th every year. They wanted to blow up Parliament. And this is a representation of what the old Parliament building used to look like before it was rebuilt. By God's grace, they were prevented from doing this. Now, why did God prevent them from doing this? Because that king, King James I, the year before the gunpowder plot, now the gunpowder plot was 1605. 1604, King James I had authorized the translating of the Bible from the Hebrew and the Greek into English. This is the Bible that we know today as the King James Bible. And while there were Catholic hands behind the plot, the Bible tells us that this was all part of this war that had been raging from heaven to earth. Because of the fact that God's hand had been over the Reformation, God's hand had been over England, so we have in our hands today the King James Bible. Luke's warning of Acts chapter 20 had been fulfilled when he warned the church to take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock to feed the church of God. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves 
shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away uh, disciples after them. Luke in chapter 9 and verse 23, he reveals what Christ said. Christ said, if any of you, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. But for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. The secrets of salvation in Christ were once more to be revived. No longer would Satan's doctrine of salvation by works hold the penitent sinner captive to the church, helplessly reverencing idols of wood and stone. Now the lovely Jesus would be revealed to all as the source of the power to overcome sin. The character of Jesus would once again be upheld as the goal of every Christian. The shackles that had bound the Bible were now broken by the translating of the King James Bible, and it now became the property of every man, woman, and child. And despite that, of course, we know that the path would not be an easy one. Sin had held sway for hundreds of years, but when we take up our cross daily, when we follow Christ, when we decide that whosoever will lose their life, the same will save it, what does that mean? The first thing that we should note is that before taking up the cross, self must be denied. Christ was talking to those people who had already been through the experience that Peter describes in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. There he said this, he said, then Peter said unto them, repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Spirit. In other words, repentance has been felt. The sinner feels himself being drawn to the watery grave because the Holy Spirit, for it to dwell within the sinner's heart, the heart must first be emptied of that which fills it initially. The Bible says this very clearly. You see in Matthew chapter 15, verses 18 to 20, but those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. So the heart, the center of our emotions, which can so easily rule over the head, the center of our reason, must be subdued. This was a key point brought out in the Bible. By reason, we may accept the idea that there is a God. By reason, we may accept the rightness of following God's path. By reason, we may accept God's law as the right way of governing our lives. By reason, we may see God's footprints in the prophecies of the Bible. But as anyone who has ever fallen in love with the wrong person can readily testify, the heart can overrule reason. How many times confronted with temptation does our mind tell us that it would not be wise to pursue that course, but the heart overrules and we succumb to temptation. Christ made it plain self must die. And so there is that symbol of death, the cross. And for many, or for all of us, having decided to deny self for the Christian, it is the implement, the cross, on which self dies. Taking up the cross means putting self to death. Taking up the cross means voluntarily surrendering control of one's life. Only by killing self can the Holy Spirit dwell within, and this can only be done by making the decision. Christ will not make that decision for us. If it did, then it would mean he was imposing his will on us, and he will never do that. We have to make that choice for ourselves. So victory comes via the cross. 
we take up the cross. The old man, the self that succumbs so easily to sin is put to death and that empty space is filled by the Holy Spirit. For he that is dead, Romans chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And did you hear that? Keeping or not keeping the law actually does nothing. It's the death of self and the becoming of a new creature, having a new life, the life that Christ promised when he said, in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. In John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believed on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but by God. You know, preachers can give sermons on how the remedy for the world is love and social inclusiveness and all these different things. But the scriptures say that the only way to deal with sin begins with death. It's the daily dying of self that makes room for the living of Christ. And so this leaves us with a most important question. How do I empty myself of self? And the answer comes back very simply, I cannot. But what I can do is surrender my will to Christ. Die daily to self and surrender to God's control, allowing him to take control and he will work his good will in our lives. He will do the work in our lives, not us. As we surrender ourselves to him daily, he will work in us his good pleasure and the whole nature will be brought under the control of the Spirit of Christ. Just like he did to Christ, Satan will also tempt us to come down off our crosses, using the annoyances of life that cause a curse word to come to the lips or the desires of the appetite that cause us to lust after the things of this world. But God has promised us a way out. He says through Paul in 1 Corinthians, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be attempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. The very book the book that Muslims claim as their holy book tells them to seek out the people of the book. Why does it tell them that? Because despite himself, Satan cannot do anything but to witness Christ. And so it is pointed out to the Muslims, go to the Christians, go to the people of the book, go to. Now, who are the people of the book today? Do you know the Seventh-day Adventist Church? The Seventh-day Adventists have been known almost since their inception as the people of the book, people who follow the Bible. If you're going to find today the people of the book, this is where you go to find them, in the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And Muslims are recognizing this. In fact, there was one Muslim sheikh, one leader, who came out and said to his followers, if you want to find the Ahl al-Kitab, if you want to find the people of the book, go to the Seventh-day Adventists. Do you realize what an awesome responsibility we have today? We are the only people that can give the true gospel to those who are seeking it. So as we've looked through this voyage that we've taken through Revelation chapter 9, you can see how God has used Islam to preserve his people, to bring us to a point where we have the Bible, but also he is bringing us to the point where we are due to fulfill his commission. And his commission is that we go out, we seek out everyone and give the gospel to them. Now let's just think for a minute. If I said to you, 
shall we go to the Catholics and seek them out? There's many that will say, yes, yes, I'm versed in, in the Bible. I will go and talk with the Catholics and give them the truth. If I was to say to you, should we go to the Methodist, to the Baptist, if I was to name any denomination, you will say to me, yes, John, let us go and reason with them. We can show them the Sabbath. We can show them biblical truths. But you know, there are some people that we are ignoring. Generally, in this country, 4.8, almost 5% of the population is Muslim. If we come to London, in London, it's 12.9% of the population that's Muslim. If we go to Southall, what percentage in Southall is Muslim? I'm going to suggest to you off the top of my head, because I can't remember the true figures, but I believe it's around 20 plus percent of people who are Muslim in the Southall area. Now, what does that mean? Why does that have any relevance to us? Well, very simply, when we looked at Matthew 24 last week, do you remember we looked at the last sign of Christ's return? The last sign was Christ said that he will not come unless or until the gospel has been preached to everyone. Now, if the gospel is to be preached to everyone, who do we leave out? Do we ignore the Muslims? Do we leave out, as a minimum in London, do we leave out one in every eight people that are here in, the, in, in London? Do we leave out one in every five that are, that are in the Southall area? If we do that, Christ will not come. And who will be responsible? It will be down to us. Because, look, I'm not saying we have to go and convert every Muslim that's in the area. The same as I wouldn't dare to say we have to go and convert everyone that lives around us. But Christ says they must have the opportunity to hear the gospel. If we are not taking the gospel out there, they will not hear it. So, brothers and sisters, I want to finish by saying, first of all, we've got to make our calling and election sure. But secondly, I want to say this. If we ignore those people around us, if we ignore those who in times past have been used to preserve Christianity, we are not doing our job as Christians. We need to wake up, we need to stand up, and we need to go out. 